wait, I'm, and it was scared me. And it was right at that moment as I'm trying to do that second push and I'm watching my body shake that I realized I couldn't breathe when the mm. truck is falling on me to collapse my lungs. And as I'm doing that second push, my body shaking, there was this realization that I'm doing this, <gasps> mm. trying to suck in air and I couldn't. And it was just another like this, you know, I'm already going weak. There's all this fear. There's already all this crazy pain. And I realized, oh yeah, I can't breathe either. And I'm just trying to do that second push and I, and I'm fighting for a breath. My heart is just racing because I'm in shock. My heart is heart rate is elevated. And you know, it is when you're really busy or physically active physically. And sometimes you can hear your pulse. You can literally hear your own pulse in your head. It was that, you know, my heart was just racing. And the strangest thing Eric was, is like when my, when I bled out, and I heart, and my heart stopped after I bled out. The weirdest thing is I literally heard my own heart stop. It was racing and it was just like shut. It sounded just like shutting off an engine. Bup, 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 bup. And on the last beat, literally like at the, the, the simultaneous with the last beat, my spirit left my body when my heart mm. stopped and went up to the roof of the garage. People have heard about near death or out of body experiences. In fact, there's eight to 10 million people alive in the world today who've claimed to have a near death or autobot experience. And I'm, I'm a skeptic. So I say, let's say, you know, let's go to the, you know, go to the smaller number, you know, let's say it's, it's only, you know, 8 million people, you know, let's say 75% of them are lying or crazy. Yeah. They'll still leave 2 million people. Yeah. Even if the majority are lying or crazy, that's still right, leave right. 2 million people that really had an autobot experience. I know I did. My spirit is out here up like, I don't know, 14, 15, 16 feet in the ceiling, right up into the bottom of this, this big implement garage. Uh, I can just tell you anybody watching today or listening or at any point that if you are a Christian and you, you believe in Jesus, you've asked him to be your Lord and savior to wash away your sins. That as a Christian, we should never be afraid of death mm -hmm. ever, ever. In fact, I, I say this and people get mad sometimes when I say this, but the day you die is going to be the best day of your life. It really yeah. is. The, the, the second I died and my spirit went to the body, my, my spirit left my body and went up to the roof. The peace that I experienced, I can't even describe to you. And the Bible has a word. It talks about that. And it says peace that surpasses mental understanding. That's what I had. So I say, I make jokes about it or try to describe it. I, I was having a, a party in the ceiling. So I'm up in the ceiling, just completely <laughs> the best peace times a million, the best I've ever felt in my life. Looking down an accident scene, I can, I was listening to all the emergency people talking, um, everything was, you know, I'm listening to it, watching it all from above, no fear, no sorrow. None. I didn't, I was so disconnected from the accident scene. I didn't even realize the guy in the truck was me. I mm -hmm. was just like, just watching it happen. I'm looking down. I can see Leonard. Um, he's on his knees. He's above me. Again, they haven't pulled me out. Just this much of me sticking out from me at the front of the truck. He's crying. He's apologizing. He's saying stuff like, I'm listening to it all from the ceiling. He's saying stuff like, I'm such an old fool. I should be the one that's dead, not you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because he had jacked up the truck and not used the safety equipment. Mm. Um, you know, he's crying. He's apologizing. And I'm up in the roof and I could care less. Just watch it from above. They're not doing CPR because I have a major chest trauma. So, I mean, I'm crushing the chest. They're not going to do CPR. So, at this point, they're like, it's too, too late for this guy. He's passed. So, they're all just standing around. They're letting Leonard cry. They're talking. You know, there's there's eight people there. I can count from above. And at the moment, as I'm watching them both, so Leonard is in the middle of the truck. He's over the top of me. He's running his fingers through my ear. He's crying. People are standing on each side of him, but standing up off the sides over in the corners of the truck. And on each side of Leonard was an angel. And Leonard, I said, like I said, he's a little over six feet tall, and he's on his knees. And these angels were on their knees just like him on his left and on his right. But their heads stuck up approximately two feet taller, estimating, guesstimating. So that would have made them approximately eight feet tall. White shining robes, no wings, very muscular, long hair, um, long hair that went down to where the belt was on the robe. The one from the driver's side. So they're lean, they're on their knees, they're leaned over just like Leonard was. The one from the driver's side reaches over and he puts his hands right in the middle of the flat spot of the guy that's hurt down there. The one from the passenger side does the same thing. So they're both reached over the middle and with their hands in the flat spot. So I'm watching from above and I go to myself, oh, those angels are down there to help that guy. And it didn't even seem like a big deal. It just seemed, it's so weird as it sounds. It, so, seemed, weird. it seemed natural. So you, you, 
you're basically dead. You're 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 above the ceiling. You're watching this. Mm -hmm. um, you, it's like you're kind of detached, but at peace. Yeah. So so you shouldn't have been knowing the different conversations that are going. You you'd be out. You know. Um, but because you're having this out of body experience, you're aware. So that's already pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, and then it's on top of that, really. and then on top of that, you see these these two big big guys basically yeah. holding your body together. Yeah, touching me in the middle. Okay. Touching that guy in the middle that I didn't know it's me at this point. Okay. So you've I'm never, just, you've never seen, I mean, you've never had any kind of a, up to this point in your life, you've never seen, seen a vision an angel? or an angel or never seen an angel. hallucinated or anything oh, like that before. I did drugs and alcohol for a long time, dude. I'm sure there's plenty of times I hallucinated. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Well, that's. But I, I never claimed to see an angel before. But you never claimed to see an angel before. Okay. No. no so I'm ahead. just watching it all happen. Okay. And that's. And here's a really cool detail. Mm -hmm. The garage, I explained to you how it is. The, the, the semi truck is in the back. My service truck is backed up to it. What I didn't say is there's a blacktop driver that goes out from the front of that garage out to the road that this building is on. That this facility is on. Everybody came from as I'm on the ceiling, I'm looking down at the front of the truck. The hood is shut. I told you, you know, there's Leonard, there's angels on each side. So I'm looking this way. The entrance is behind me. All of the emergency workers came from behind me, the black top, the main entrance. The last two people to get there, I watched get there when I was up in the ceiling. And in the back corner of the shop, the opposite end, a red haired lady and a gray haired guy came in that little service door in the back of the shop. Mm -hmm. So she came up the driver's side of the truck, as did he. She gets down between the angels, where it moves Leonard out of the way, gets down between the angels. Leonard stands off to the drive. As I'm looking from above, he's standing in the driver's side corner. She's down between the angels. She's feeling for a pulse. There's a big guy in what I would call farmer bibs on the passenger's corner. And he says to her, it's too late. He's been dead several minutes. She ignores him. She keeps falling, feeling for a pulse. I'm listening to it all from above. And she says, what is his name? And that's when um, Leonard, the other mechanic, says Bruce Vanetta. So this first responder lady named Shannon starts to red-haired lady starts to slap this guy in the face down there that turned out to be me, and she starts saying, "Bruce, come back, Bruce mm -hmm. Vanetta, come back." All the other people in the place now these are, you know, to be in the volunteer fire department, if you're going to be a first responder, you have to have some kind of medical knowledge, I would assume, and they all stopped as I'm watching her above. They all stopped and looked at her. Like she was crazy. So let me just stop there and say this. A year later when I got out of the hospital, I spent I spent more than a year in the hospital. A year later when I got out of the hospital, I went and visited that volunteer fire department to tell them thank you on one of their monthly meetings. And I told the chief I was coming, but he didn't tell anybody else. It was a surprise. They start their meeting. I come walking out. They don't even recognize me because it's been over, you know, it's been a year at this point, over a year. And so I just I thanked them. And then I went around the room. There was like 30 people in the room at this volunteer fire department. I went around the room and I pointed out eight out of 30, let's say roughly 30. I pointed out eight mm -hmm. of the 10 people that came to the scene of the accident. And then the other two, I pointed to the red haired lady and the gray haired guy. And I said, now you two came in the back door. Everybody else came in the main entrance. You came in the back door. Why? Mm -hmm. I had been there three days i have been going in out the main entrance. I've been back in my truck, up that driveway, you know, and then turn around and back it into the shop for three days and didn't even know there was a secondary driveway that came to that facility further down the road. And because it had been here, it, they didn't even remember right away. They had to think about it, the, the red-haired lady, Shannon, and the guy. And they're like, oh, we missed the first driveway, drove past, saw the flashing lights, hit a secondary driveway that came up to the back of the shop, and then that's why they entered in the back. But I just, Eric, I just want to stop yeah. and say, for the true skeptic or doubter, here's a guy laying at the truck, no heartbeat, no no pulse. Yeah. Six, depending on who which person you believe, six to eight to ten minutes. Mm -hmm. And I told them which door these people yeah. came in. Wow. No heartbeat, no pulse. Wow. For minutes. So right there proves the real Bruce was in the ceiling. Yeah. The real Bruce was up in the ceiling. Just yeah. my dead body was laying on the truck. Interesting. Wow. You know, so I watched, and so that was a year later that I that that, that whole transpired. So back to the scene of the accident. I'm watching her above. She's feeling for a pulse. She can't find one. She says, "What's his name?" She starts slapping, and everybody stopped and starts just looking at her like she's crazy. Like, 
what are you doing? He hasn't had a heartbeat or pulse for minutes, and you're going to slap him in the face and call him back? Like, it made no sense. So everybody just stops now just looking at her. She gets emphatic. She gets louder and louder. And all of a sudden, my spirit starts creeping down from out of the ceiling closer and closer to my body, which, again, I still didn't know it's me. And when I got, it seemed like maybe halfway, it went really fast. And next thing I know, my spirit came back inside my body. My heart starts. I go from feeling the best I've ever felt in my life to the worst I've ever felt back to this horrendous pain. And the first thing was I just I come back in my body. It was like, oh, and I said a four-letter word that stands for fertilizer. And I'm just like, oh, blank, this hurts so bad. I don't want it. And I'm the guy underneath the truck. And it all just like came back so quick to me that, oh, that's right. I remember the truck fell on me. I was in the truck when, I, when it fell on me and I'm watching from above. And it's like putting those two things together in my head to realize that I'm the guy that I was watching from above. It's me and all this horrible pain is just like, oh no, this hurts so bad. I don't want it. It, I, it hurts so bad. I don't want it. And I remember thinking that, you know, whether I said it out loud or I don't know, I, but I know in my spirit, this hurts so bad. I don't want it. My heart stopped. My spirit left my body. I went right back in the roof of the garage where I was 14, 15, 16 feet. I'm looking down. I can see the angels on each side. I can see the red-haired lady, Shannon, above me. And now I know it's me. And I'm up. And a lot of times in these near-death body experiences, people talk about seeing a tunnel. That's when, right then, I'm up in the roof, in the garage. And at a 45-degree angle on this side of the garage, a tunnel opened up and went out of the roof of the garage and went up at a 45-degree angle. And it seemed like the tunnel was you know, a million miles long, but there was a bright light on the end of it. And I know that I know that I know that I know heaven was on the end of the tunnel. I got in the tunnel and I started going towards the bright light to meet God. And I was happy. I was excited about it. Like I remember being, uh, I remember feeling G force in the tunnel. Like, like when you're in a, uh, a roller coaster or a really fast car or a motorcycle or something, you're feeling that G force. I remember feeling the G force. I was going that fast in the tunnel towards the light, being happy to go meet Jesus. But then somewhere behind me that I couldn't see, I could hear her. Bruce started to come back, come back. I stopped in the tunnel. And again, it felt like man, maybe I was halfway there. I got sucked backwards out of the tunnel. Now my spirit is back in the garage, in the ceiling, looking down from above. I can see her. I can see the angels. I know it's me now. I see her slapping. And I didn't want to even come back. And my spirit comes back into my body. My heart starts again supernaturally. Mm. I'm back in this horrendous pain. And I remember the angels, right? So I looked on my left. And I looked on my right from the angels that I had seen touch him in the middle. And I couldn't see him. There was nothing there yeah, with there. my flesh eyes. And it really scared me because, again, there's this horrible pain that I can't even describe to you how bad it was. So I've got this horrible pain. They've got this flat spot. I'm thinking, yeah, you. I know I'm dying because I'm leaving my spirits in my body. And I look for the angels to, like, you know, make sure that they're still helping me. And I couldn't see them. And, again, it was just really scary because I was thinking, where did they go? Why did they leave? And it was in that confusion and pain and craziness that I heard a still small whisper. The Bible talks about God talks to us. You mentioned it off air earlier, you know, that still small whisper that sometimes you hear people, mm -hmm. God talking to people. And I heard that still small whisper from inside of me. I believe the Holy Spirit, God, he wasn't scared. He wasn't freaking out. He wasn't, you know, in shock like I was. Very calmly, all the whisper said was this, if you want to live, you're going to have to fight, and it's going to be a hard fight. Hmm. No quoting scripture. No, you know, I didn't see anything. Nothing. He didn't talk in King James or anything. <laughs> no. No. Like, yeah, exactly. No, nothing like what you it think. It sound like Charles Charlton Heston or something. Yeah. Right, right. I yeah. joke about that sometimes. No, it was just this very calm voice. It just simply said, if you want to live, you're going to have to fight, and it's going to be a hard fight. And uh, it didn't take me but <laughs> two seconds to think about it say, literally screw this i don't want to fight it hurts too bad mm -hmm. i don't i don't want this when i when i made that decision again my heart stopped my spirit left my body i went up roof of the garage the third time i'm now back where i was and completely aware that that body under the, that truck is me mm -hmm. i can see the angels again now even though i just couldn't see them in my body when my heart stops i can look down and there they are they're still there uh and the tunnel opened up, and I got in the tunnel, going to the light. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to heaven, going to meet Jesus, and I'm excited. I'm in the tunnel, going to the light, and then I hear it again. Bruce started to come back, come back. I stopped in the tunnel, got sucked backwards that second time. I looked down. 
I could see her. I could see the angels. My spirit came back into my body the, the third and final time. And when I came in that last time, I, I looked at her. Her face was right here. I'm still laying on the creeper. She was right here. And uh, she says to me, Mr. You're on the verge of life and death. What do you have to fight for? Do you have a wife? Do you have kids? When she said that, it was the weirdest mm -hmm. thing because I knew that I knew that I knew the small whisper that it, that I knew was God, that had just talked to me last time and said, if you want to live, you're going to have to fight. It's going to be a hard fight. Somehow that same whisper was talking through this woman mm -hmm. and says to me, you're on the verge of life and death. What do you have to fight for? Do you have a wife? Do you have kids? So God used her to remind me I was married and had four small children. Up until that moment, I had not even thought about it because the pain, the trauma, the craziness at all, it never even crossed my mind up until that exact moment when she said, what do you have to fight for? You're on the verge of life and death. Do you have a wife? Do you have kids? So I thought of Lori and my four small children at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, because of my background, because of my life um, early as a young man and even as a whatever, I had contemplated suicide many, many times. So that feeling of peace was exactly what I've been looking for my whole life. Right. And if it was just up to me, I would have been gone and I would not be here talking to you. But yeah. when she said, what do you have to fight for? Do you have a wife? Do you have kids? And I thought of Lori and the kids and they were so young. And I thought to myself, maybe foolishly, but I thought to myself, they need me. Um, I'll stay for them. Not for me, but my family needs me. So she said, sure. keep your eyes open, stay.